of the three lectures in the SeaCard inaugural lecture series. Uh, a lot of you were here last night and know some of the basic details, but uh, for those of you from uh, Norman Wolf's S&H 230 who weren't here last night, I'll give you a bit of background. Uh, SeaCard was established uh, in October 1987 at Iowa State. SeaCard uh, stands for Center for Indigenous Knowledge for Ag and Rural Development. And we got organized. We're still in the process of getting organized, but uh, uh, started the process about 18 months ago and now have eight grad students uh, working with us and a uh, number of faculty from four or five departments and uh, are in the process of establishing the capacity to document published and unpublished documents that uh, involve indigenous knowledge and decision-making systems, particularly as these reflect on the, the international development scene. Uh, as we've worked to uh, establish ourselves in an international network, we've taken advantage of Iowa State's linkages with a number of institutions. Uh, those of you who were here last night uh, had the pleasure of listening to Professor Adetitun Phillips, who's the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of Social and Economic Research, you know, who, flow, who flew directly here from uh, Lagos, and due to heavy duties, uh, took off this morning to fly directly back to Lagos. And uh, he was introduced last night by Mr. Uh, Jeff Beard, who's one of the administrators at Pioneer Hybrid International. Most of you are familiar with Pioneer. It's probably the world's largest uh, uh, seed company. And they have supported SeaCard and have provided us funding for a good computer and printer and software. And they are all very secure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tied down, bolted down, and uh, they've also provided us some money f to produce the quarterly newsletter. The first one's gone out so, some months ago, and the second one's at the printers right now. Uh, I mentioned last night uh, the mailing has increased rather dramatically, and there are now something like 1,200 individuals and institutions on the mailing list. and goes to more than 100 countries. Uh, the response seems to have been very substantial. And it's growing, and I suspect it's going to continue to grow. Um, tonight, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, bringing to the second inaugural lecture a good friend and colleague who has been the director of Iowa State's linkage with the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. There must be half a dozen of us, and some of us in this audience, who've had the pleasure of going to Holland, and some of us have, on multiple occasions, dropped fresh herring with Jan and Mady Slickerveer, and washed it down with all kinds of exciting fluids that the, uh, <laughs> the uh, Dutch have an incredible in indigenous knowledge about. And, uh, uh, he's been over here with his wife, Mady. This is the second visit. We have one of his students who's part of our exchange, uh, Carolina Peters, sitting back there in the blue, who is uh, working on our PhD here as part of the exchange in sociology. Uh, He will be introduced, and the chairperson for this session uh, is another good friend of ours and a strong supporter of CCAR. That's Dr. Gail McClure. Many of you have met her. Uh, Gail has a very interesting background. Um, she was born in Kansas. I mean, that's interesting. <laughs> and. <laughs> yeah. She moved up to Minnesota after a number of years and uh, became the assistant director of the 
Cooperative Extension Service for the state of Minnesota and uh, ended up in the Caribbean on one of the University of Minnesota's U.S. aid projects and uh, then got captured by the Academy for Educational Development and she is their Vice President for Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, <clears throat> background is ag communications, agricultural education and uh, she understands very clearly the kinds of missions we've set for ourselves here through CCARD and the CCARD network um, and has supported us in, in a number of ways including uh, funding through the Academy for Educational Development, a very important workshop that was held at the Academy in Washington in December. Uh, more than a hundred people came to that. The topic was uh, the role of indigenous knowledge for agriculture and international development. There were people from the World Bank, Inter-American Foundation, USAID, and uh, she managed to give us resources so we were able to take half a dozen of our students and I think five of us faculty went and took part in the workshop and then helped fund the publication of the monograph that came out of it which was also very useful for us. We've just finished signing a memorandum of understanding between Iowa State and AED and I think that will facilitate us coordinating and cooperating in joint ventures international development projects uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. So uh, Gail will be chairing the session tonight and we'll do the formal introduction of Jan, my Dutch brother. <laughs> and, uh, I think that Mike did a very good job of introducing Jan already. <laughs> I want to say that I'm very happy to be here and uh, very pleased to uh, be a part of the development of this important topic. Mike is a very important person uh, to all of us, uh, his dedication uh, to this. Uh, in Washington we see the need but we often don't have the time and the intensity to spend in developing these ideas but we want in every way possible to support them that we can and to make sure that the donor community is responsive and begin to developing these kinds of concepts in, into their planning processes. Uh, and Mike is uh, such a dedicated person we don't want to miss out on it when something like this uh, happens. It is my uh, total pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. L. Jan Slikavir. Last night, Dr. Phillips said that he couldn't spell <laughs> indigenous or occasional. I'll tell you, Schlickavir is something I can't spell, so I put it behind here. Uh, for <laughs> as only today I got it pronounced correctly, I think. Uh, Dr. Schlickavir is the director of a program called LEAD. The acronym stands for Director of the Leiden Ethnosystems and Development Program. He's a professor of anthropology. Uh, at the Institute of Cultural and Social Studies at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, he directs a multidisciplinary research group dealing with indigenous knowledge systems for agricultural and health development. I'm very fascinated by the interdisciplinary nature uh, of his work and his ability to, to look past boundaries that are often uh, confining to, to many of us. He's worked in countries such as Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, uh, Senegal, Indonesia, a true citizen of the world and an ambassador, I think, to the world. One of the things I'm most struck by is uh, the fact that he carries this sense of uh, promoting not only the indigenous knowledge but a sense of goodwill about people working in development uh, wherever he goes. And one of the things I thank him most for is having the good sense to marry a brilliant woman and bring her with him to places like this. It makes all of our lives more interesting. Dr. Slicker. <laughs> Well, Dr. McClure, thank you very much for this most kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate that you have come here in such a great numbers. Before I turn to the subject of this evening, uh, being the lecture on uh, ethnosystems innovation and development, I would like to take this opportunity and express my feelings of appreciation for the invitation for being here. Uh, with you tonight at Iowa State University. In fact, I regard it as a great pleasure and indeed an honor uh, to be invited uh, at CCART together with my wife, Mady, and present a lecture on the occasion of the inaugural lecture series of uh, the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Agriculture and Rural Development, which we 
in fact in Leiden regard as a major step in the international efforts uh, for structuring the potential and the importance of indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous technical knowledge in the socio-economic and cultural development process and then in particular in the developing countries. I think the need for the institutionalization of a center such as CCART has over the past decades emerged as an essential instrument for recording and for the operationalization of indigenous knowledge and practices and as such perhaps uh, crossed the mind uh, of a few of us who have come to realize that the so-called other cultures uh, most of us were fortunate to work with uh, because of their work uh, and which sometimes in the past were belittled as primitive and simple suddenly in the wake of the present overwhelming of the West by problems of overdevelopment and post-industrial frustrations uh, proved to possess much refined and sophisticated uh, mechanisms for adaptation and in fact long-term survival which I think now even might outrun the short-term success of Western cultures and societies. But as we say in Holland, vele zijn geroepen en weinige zijn uitverkoren. Many are called upon, but only very few are chosen. And in the international circles of anthropologists and development sociologists who have come to appreciate the role of indigenous knowledge systems in development, I think the primus inter pares uh, among those few is undoubtedly Dr. Michael Warren, whose unflagging enthusiasm and energy has not only stimulated the work of many fellow anthropologists and sociologists, but who has managed to concretize the establishment of CCART, being a most important stage in the development of a more realistic, balanced, and indeed promising approach towards the development of human systems around the globe. Uh, Dr. Warren, uh, you called m myself uh, your brother. I think you are my big brother. Our <laughs> University of Leiden, as you know, the oldest university in the Netherlands, who was established 414 years ago in the year 1575. In fact, as a result of the victory in Leiden, in the struggle for freedom from the Spanish yoke over a four-generation period of time, and its royal ca uh, charter of King William I, the founding father, so to say, of our present uh, royal House of Orange, bears a seal still in use today, as you know from our uh, st uh, stationery, inscribed with the motto, Academia Lugduno Batava Presidium Libertatis, the Academy of Leiden, Bulwark of Freedom. Well, it's not so much um, the parallel between your efforts and struggle to establish Seacard and the fourth generation struggle of the inhabitants of Leiden in the 16th century, but I think rather the metaphor of Seacard as a bulwark of indigenous knowledge within Iowa State University and beyond. And this has prompted the appreciation and high esteem of my university, and in particular of our Leiden Ethno Systems and Development Program for your work in this respect, that I ask you to come forward and accept the representation of the so-called Great Seal of the Leiden University in its original colors and calligraphed by my wife on the occasion of the inaugural lectures of Seacard as a great achievement with which we want to congratulate you, your staff, your department, the university, Iowa, and where I in particular also wish to include our congratulations uh, to the unselfish support and dedication of your wife Mary and your daughter Medina. This is not a blanket <laughs> where you can sleep <laughs> on, <laughs> but we had to carry it in the. So this is the. Oh. Uh,
right now we're uh, following squatters' rights in room 326 Curtis, so when we put this up, it would be more difficult for the administration to kick us out. Uh, so, uh, thank you very okay. much. We, okay. on behalf thank, of you. thank you. Well, if I now may return to the subject of this lecture this evening, uh, uh, and especially then on ethnosystems innovation and development. I use the term ethnosystems as a sort of, um, well, you could say a rather inclusive term referring to often unique entities of conceptions and practices, rather group or, if you wish, ethnospecific and generally localized in rural peripheries as opposed to centralized, more urban, uh, urban systems often originally in the West, for which I would choose the term cosmopolitan systems of shortly cosmos systems. Uh, such ethnospecific systems of indigenous knowledge and practice based on an historical experiment and experience, in particular settings, possess many dimensions encompassing linguistics, education, socialization, medicine, agri and horticulture, animal husbandry, artisan skills, ecological knowledge, kinship, and what you could generally call social structures. Compared to indigenous knowledge systems per se, our concept of ethnosystems perhaps goes a little bit beyond the whole system of knowledge, including concepts, beliefs, perceptions, and it concurrently also seeks to include the praxis often referred to in your frame of reference, indigenous technical knowledge, but also local channels of communication, decision-making systems, and perhaps even further to refer to the concept of culture itself, be it in a more dynamic sense than anthropologists generally used to do. I think indeed the conception of ethnosystems from a systemic and dynamic perspective on culture allows us not only to approach the cognitive and behavioral components of particular communities in a rather holistic way, but also enables us to elaborate the classical culture concept in a more dynamic way of historical processes in what not only acculturation and transculturation between different cultures has occurred, and I refer here to the great and the little traditions as used by Robert Ralf uh, Redfield, but in which the interface and the interaction between local systems and national or cosmos systems can be assessed in a more balanced way. And in this context, the term ethnosystems is more an articulation of a specific culture or subculture, describing indigenous systems of knowledge, techniques, practices, which not per se will be attributed to local people in the third world, in peripheries in the third world, but eventually, I think, would also include specific terms in Western Europe and the United States, and for that matter, in the Soviet Union. If we place this conception within the recent development of the social sciences, and then, of course, in particular, in anthropology and development sociology, it's evident that it predominantly exists within the praxis of interaction where ethnosystems as local structures of perceptions and practices are continuously confronted with process of social and cultural change, innovation and development from outside. So theoretically, in the use of the term ethnosystems, we see four major aspects to be involved. The culture specific or culture bound reference of the term, the holistic approach towards the inclusion of a range of subsystems of knowledge and like I said in agriculture, medicine, education. Third, the need for a more dynamic assessment of the culture concept. And fourth, the need for a rather realistic interest in a non-normative non-Western oriented orientation. Now if we regard this uh, concept of ethnosystems within its historical processes of social cultural change and technical innovation, 
its dynamic dimensions not only become discernible within these systems, but, and I think even more important, in its interaction between ethno and cosmo systems, which enables us then to wider our research interest to include the behavioral component of the development and innovation process. And here, I believe that this behavioral uh, component, in fact, uh, gives us now a new impetus to a form of a sort of neo-ethnoscience, as indeed the initial high hopes of the ethnoscience and the cognitive anthropology of the 50s and the 60s in terms of well-documented, refined studies of sophisticated material or languages like an ethno uh, linguistics or the ethnopsychological data on beliefs and conceptions run the risk of walking into a scientific cul-de-sac at that end. And I believe that the recent decade of this what you could call second generation of ethnoscience initiated by the pioneering work of Brockenshaw, Warren, and Werner in his textbook, uh, in their textbook, Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Development from 1980, uh, took a most promising alley into the direction of a more behavioristic approach to innovation and development in which the acting individuals within these ethnosystems were chosen as the primary source for development from below. In this context, I immediately wish to mention Dr. Warren's own much earlier and broader interpretation of medical ideas and practices, where he in 1974 already presented his description of disease etiology and knowledge among the Bono in Ghana as part of the whole process of diagnosis and treatment. And also, myself, I was able in my research in Ethiopia to include the local perceptions and practices and disease classification of certain ethnic groups within a longitudinal uh, study of healthcare utilization uh, among Oromo, Somali, and Amhara in the Ogaden region of Eastern Ethiopia. Now, to what extent does our work in Leide fit into this rather theoretical reorientation starting in the late 70s, in fact, and in what practical setting has this recently further been operationalized from Leiden on? Well, again, I go a little bit back in history. Our university, the first chair in ethnography, was established more than 100 years ago in 1879 called the Volkenkunde van Oost-Indië, the ethnography of the East Indies, it won't surprise you, and uh, which over the years evolved into ethnology, even indology, the specific uh, study for training of civil servants and diplomats to work overseas in the Dutch East Indies, and after the World War, finally into cultural anthropology. Now, parallel to this development, uh, we saw the development of sociology, or if you wish, Western sociology, focused on groups and processes in the Western Hemisphere, the sub-discipline then of the sociology of the non-Western peoples, developed in Leiden as a specific area of the social sciences research and training in third world countries. So today, under the protection of the Netherlands law on education, two major disciplines exist, culturele anthropology, cultural anthropology, and sociologie der nietwesterse volken, development sociology. Um, apart from Leiden, you can study these two sub-disciplines of the development-oriented social sciences, also in Utrecht, in Amsterdam, and in Nijmegen. Now, if we concentrate on the study in Leiden, we see on the one hand cultural anthropology with its so-called Leiden tradition in structural anthropology, which is very much following the French school of Levi-Strauss in structural anthropology, and um, of old more or less refraining from involvement in development and development-related issues. While at the other hand, uh, we see that the non-Western sociologists or development sociologists 
are paying much more effort to facilitate and to embed uh, the uh, acculturation and acceptance of rather Western perceptions and practices in third world countries. Well, meanwhile, in the course of the 70s, a few staff of what we would call the second generation of the Institute, uh, who worked in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Senegal, in Ivory Coast, in India, and in Ethiopia, developed a rather different approach to the process development and change, more in the line of what we discussed a minute ago in terms of the ethno systems. Um, they were reapprising, on the one hand, certain conceptions from cultural anthropology, and, other, and on the other hand, uh, tried to leave sometimes the Western oriented approach of the development sociology for a more indigenous oriented perspective on these processes of socioeconomic uh, development and change. Now, we have seen that in the course of the 80s, they decided to form a group of anthropologists and sociologists who not only seek to expand the ethno-scientific approach to include the behavioral component, what we mentioned a minute ago, into its theorem, but even more dedicate its work to problem solving in the praxis, a sort of applied oriented approach. This group later on evolved into the present laden ethno systems and development program lead, which now is involved in several teaching and research projects in different countries. Now, before I elaborate on the actual joint research efforts of LEAD in terms of the geographical regions and the research topics, I shortly wish to mention that, interestingly enough, the earlier Leiden tradition in structural anthropology included, in fact, two most useful concepts which could be brought within the scope of the LEAD program. First, the concept of the participant's view, and secondly, the concept of the field of ethnographic study. Uh, the concept of participant's view, you could say that by involving the participant's view into the whole process of innovation and development, the individual's perceptions and attitudes evolved, as it were, onto a more systematic level as an important scientific and additional component of the study of ethno systems, their worldview, their perceptions, and their decision making mechanisms. And I think this approach not only links up with the emic view on cultures from within as contrasted uh, to the ethic view from outside on a national or even an international level, but also fits very well in the approach which is one of the foundations of the um, uh, C-card approach towards the issues we are talking about here. If we speak about the field of ethnological study, we saw that in 1935, in the one of the early Leiden structural anthropologists, uh, a certain Van Wouden, developed a concept of ethnologic field of study, EFS, or anthropologic uh, uh, field of study, during his field work in Indonesia, starting from the linguistic situation in which alongside uh, with the original lingua franca of the so-called uh, Bazar Malay, which was derived from the classical Malay, a series of regional languages existed over the whole um, country. And he found that in what he called the uh, ethnological field of study of Indonesia, certain pan-Indonesian features that characterized and at the same time delineated the area which later on similarly was uh, documented with studies on cultural traits such as kinship classifications, patterns of social organization, ornament on bronze kettle drums, patterns of woven cloth, and perceptions in medicine. Now, nowadays we can compare Van Wouden's concept, which was later elaborated by the Jocelyn de Jong, with Hunter and Winnick's conception of a culture area or a culture province. For the Leeds program's orientation, the field of ethnological study 
proved again to be most useful in its effort to overcome some of the theoretical and methodological problems involved in our efforts to develop a truly comparative study of ethnosystems in the context of innovation and development, stressing the importance of regional comparative research. In sum, those two aspects in the study of other cultures, the participant view and FES, have in fact facilitated the study and analysis of ethnosystems in a rather broad sense, and in fact culminate in the recent reappraisal of what we could call now the cultural dimension of development. I come back to that later. In addition to the revitalization of ethnoscience and cognitive anthropology, such reorientation towards local cultures is granted, perhaps for the last time, a sympathetical understanding of its relevance for the developing nations themselves, where such a late but hopefully true interest in the indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous technical systems such as starting point from within the communities themselves has indeed started to create now a changing attitude towards our discipline and where assessment and recording of vanishing cultures no longer is the often selfish concern of the anthropologist and sociologist but perhaps eventually becomes a concern for the developing nations themselves. Within the Netherlands, our LEAP program over recent years has attracted some interest from the Department of the Indonesian Languages, where my wife is working on her PhD, especially in the field of ethnolinguistics in Indonesia, from the Technical University in Delft for support from within the indigenous knowledge systems approach at strengthening the primary health care improvement in Wenshi district in Ghana, where you're very familiar with. Your name is there familiar too, as you know. With special interest also in the construction of low-cost medical center and the introduction of a rather new medicine uh, introduced by WHO against the oncocerciasis disease, the river blindness in Ghana. We also have the interest of the Technical University in Eindhoven, who are especially involved in the transfer of knowledge and um, the introduction of small-scale oil presses in Zambia. Of course, we have then the African Studies Center in Leiden in the field of the indigenous conceptions, especially in food and nutrition in Kenya, where I myself am interested in the health and nutrition complex among the Mijikenda in Kwale Kilifi, and where Dr. Warren just mentioned it a minute, a minute ago, our PhD uh, student here at ISU, Caroline Peters, has carried out very impressive fieldwork. And in addition, I can say that in cooperation with the African Studies Center, there is a project going on with Peter Geschiere uh, on the political economic development in Cameroon. Outside the Netherlands, first and foremost, we were very pleased to join the technology and social change program from this university. Later on, signed a formal linkage relationship with Dr. Warren, Dr. Christensen in 1986. And then, of course, we were pleased to become a member of CCART. The challenges and benefits I wish to come back to later. Then the Institute of Development Research of Addis Ababa University, where I myself worked in Ethiopia in ethnomedicine. Um, Perhaps if we have time, I could a little bit elaborate on that. Then the Department of Community Health and Nutrition of the University of Nairobi, in the field of community health and traditional medicine, ethnomedicine, and food and nutrition, especially focused on the coast province I mentioned a minute ago. We have then the Department of African and Oriental Studies of the University of Crete in Raytheon in Greece, where we were strongly supported by the Erasmus Foundation of the Common Market. And of course, it is for me a great pleasure that uh, this linkage relationship also uh, is supporting uh, Dr. Warren to join us on a seminar in the Raytheon in a couple of weeks' time uh, to share his experience with some of the people from the University of Crete in the field of Afro-Oriental Studies, and where also great interest is in 
ethnoarchaeology. Two other universities to conclude this list with the Universitas Indonesia. Very interesting. A new project is pending on human resource formation, uh, including around about 11 projects, and which also include ethnoscience, ethnolinguistics, and natural resource management, hopefully to be funded by the Netherlands government. And uh, then we have the Universitas Pajanjaran, the UNPAD, on indigenous knowledge and practices in local medicine, and then in particular on the use of traditional pharmaceutical medicines in Western Java, in the highlands of, of Java, um, where last year, with the help of my wife, we did together a traditional healthcare utilization survey, and we hope to uh, pick up uh, some of the uh, uh, preliminary outcomes in five weeks' time when we have the pleasure to go to Indonesia for just a month, and then later on we hope to present some of the uh, results on the uh, Yastam conference on the use of Jammu in Bombay in January 1989. Uh, we have the University of Delhi, where uh, Dr. Brouwer is uh, studying the shelters of artisans, and especially in the field of indigenous artisan uh, technology in uh, Karnataka province. And last but not least, we have a social forestry and uh, soil management uh, project in the pipeline in Senegal. Uh, two colleagues... Uh, uh, of mine are involved there, and we hope to contribute also to a collaboration with the recently uh, emerged linkage relationship between Dr. Warren's uh, C-Card program and the um, Department of Social Forestry of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. And we hope that when Dr. Warren will join us in Crete, we'll also try to get Dr. Hoskin from FAO to join us there, being in Europe. <clears throat> well, after my work in Ethiopia, uh, my collaboration with the Department of Community Health, uh, with the just mentioned University of Nairobi, where by, by uh, coincidence I will be this fall as visiting professor in uh, community health, um, I focused on indigenous conceptions and practices in health and nutrition. I mentioned that a minute ago to you, and I just would elaborate a little bit more. Um, we right now are trying to look into the health and nutrition complex among the Michiganda groups in Kuali and Kilifi. And um, I think that this study on indigenous knowledge in food and nutrition in Kenya has brought us to the envisaged publication of a second edition uh, of the Oxford University Press publication on food and nutrition in Kenya, in which the historical dimension still is lacking. As one of the co-editors, I'm now most interested in the historical and, if you wish, even prehistorical perspectives on the origins of food production and settled agriculture in East Africa, a field which still needs some attention to fill the gaps in our insight in this part of the world. Uh, as you know, Kenya is perhaps uh, the only country in the world that can appeal to the longest and most complete record of both human's physical evolution and cultural development. It's, it is characterized by a wide variety of environmental factors that throughout history has provided uh, a selected habitat for hunter, for food gatherer, for pastoralist, and for settled agriculturism. The early history of Kenya has been dominated by three major factors. It was invaded and occupied <coughs> by the ancestors of its modern inhabitants. It witnessed the evolution of different communities whose interaction contributed to the emergence of diverse ethnic groups. And third, hunting and gathering as an economic way of life was there transformed into the development of agriculture and pastoralism, think about five, six thousand years before Christ. Further to the early and rather important discoveries of Louis and Mary Leakey at the Old Dubai Gorge in northern Tanzania and the fossils of the lower Omo Valley, 
in Ethiopia, and more recent, the findings by Richard Leakey of approximately 2.8 million years old hominid fossils east of Le Leitana, in fact in Kubifora. All these findings indicate that what is called popularly the cradle of mankind is to be located in Kenya. And although several remotely ancestral types of humankind appeared in Africa during the lower Pleistocene, some two to three million years ago, only one East African type, the famous Homo habilis, evolved into modern human in Africa and elsewhere. And um, <coughs> I think that here, especially the Neolithic period, is important in the history of humankind because it marked the origin of the domestication of animals and plants, the emergence of agriculture and pastoralism. And although so far research into the transition from food gathering to food produci production and farming in Kenya has been most incomplete, there's plenty of evidence of pastoral practices in this part of Africa. Around about 10,000 years ago, we can say that the majority of the world's people started to adopt some form of agriculture, changing from food gatherers and hunters to a completely new type of sedentary lifestyle. This transition to food production, the so-called agricultural revolution, is generally regarded as a major step in the development of Neolithic peasants, preparing the way for the formation of later urban and literate cultures in this part of Africa. As agriculture seems to have developed rather independently in several major centers in the world, comparative research so far indicates that in these different parts, the agricultural revolution took place in different ways according to local conditions, resources, and cultural traditions. Apart from three most intriguing facets of the transition to agriculture, and food production, such as the speed of the transition, the accompanying increase in population, and the universality of the change, specific and special scientific attention has recently been paid to the impact of climatic changes, environmental conditions, population growth, and last but not least, complex social structures, both as a cause of and as an effect of the so-called agricultural revolution. Following several explanatory models of Braidwood, Cohen, Bender, an international discussion was going on and indeed flared up again in the United States last December, the 20th December of 1988, on the question of the onset of, of, of complex societies before or after the agriculture transformation in prehistory. And I conclude uh, in this respect, as Richard Leakey rightly concludes, agreement on the question of why the agricultural revolution occurred is far away. Much more evidence is needed before outlining firm theories, and it may be that the agricultural revolution was so complex and involved so many different factors that no single model can ever describe it. In contrast with uh, the abundant ethno-archaeological evidence for the major centers of Mesopotamia, Syria, Turkey, si and uh, also Mesoamerica and Peru, similar research for Africa has not yet been fully explored, and evidence of the transition to agriculture has remained, like I said a minute ago, most incomplete. Although Murdoch compelled already in 1959 in his more literature-based research and survey on what he called Africa, its peoples, and their culture history. It was an influential but highly interpretative and also highly criticized years. It still produced extensive data on the origin of African cult uh, agriculture and domesticated animals. I think that specific field studies are still remotely introduced in East Africa. And I think, uh, especially here on the late Glenn Isaac, who since 1969 initially studied butchery sites of a much earlier period on the east shores of Lake Turkana. 
as uh, Clark, Desmond Clark and Brandt in 1984 noted, research into the origins of African agriculture lags 10 to 15 years behind uh, all other studies of early agriculture in Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. The reason for this arrearage is partly due to the fact that African researchers seem to linger on assumptions on explanatory models of environmental stress, diffusion theories, uh, population press, uh, independent in uh, invention, but also partly due to the meager evidence bearing on the origin of African agriculture. So far, most of the published studies are characterized by their lack of supporting archaeological evidence, and I think most important, by the fact that this evidence was rather a byproduct of investigations focusing on other issues. We, in our lead program, believe that what now is needed in this context is the introduction of a research program in Africa specifically devoted to the elucidation of the whole process of the transition to agriculture and food production, providing a much wider basis for investigation. In addition to archaeological evidence, such programs should include fieldwork data from anthropological and ethnographic uh, sites, analogy of indigenous communities which are involved in comparable